Come thou almighty King, help us on Good morning, church. It's good to see all of you this morning. We hope all of you had a very Merry Christmas. If you're visiting with us, we'd like for you to know that you are our honored guest, and we're glad that you're here, and we hope that you come back at our next appointed time. We ask just one favor for, from you. If you wouldn't mind filling out a visitor's information card out of the pew back in front of you, or if you'd like to do it online, you can text the word welcome to the number behind me on the screen, and you can fill out an information card that way. But doing that will allow us an opportunity to see how we can best serve you. We've got several announcements this morning. If you haven't already, make sure you pick up a bulletin. There will be more information in there. Just a reminder, this Wednesday we will not be having our meal at 6 o'clock or Bible classes, but we will have a group devotional in the gym at 7 o'clock. So we hope you all can join us for that time. Uh, a couple of announcements for the youth. We're not going to have Roundhouse tonight due to the holiday weekend. People still traveling back from being out of town. And I'm saddened to say that our winter retreat that we were scheduled to go on next weekend, uh, after long conversations with some parents and the elders, um, we are going to be postponing that until later in the spring. Uh, we've got a couple of kids that have tested positive. We've also got some kids that are uh, under quarantine. So we want to uh, make sure that everybody gets an opportunity to go and we are the safest that we possibly can be. Uh, a couple prayer requests. Ernest Copeland, the, the father of Carrie Hill, uh, is not doing too well. He had to, do, uh, had to have a surgery on his lungs to remove some pneumonia this last week. Uh, the surgery went well, but it's a, a long, arduous recovery process. So we want to make sure we keep that family in our prayers. Also, Brandon McBride, the nephew of Pam Allen, is going tomorrow for a PET scan. So we need to keep that family in our prayers and make sure that there's no uh, new cancer growth in him. I also have a praise here. Eddie Phillips has been receiving experimental treatments for his cancer these past few months, and it does appear to be working so far. And so Eddie and Terry appreciate all your prayers on his behalf. And we encourage everyone to check the prayer list inside of the bulletin. There are several other names. And, of course, our, our, our country, our culture, our county going through this pandemic right now. And uh, just a quick reminder, we do have our offering baskets in the back. And so if you haven't already done so, you can leave your contribution there as you leave. And make sure you pick up your communion supplies in the back as well. That's all for the announcements. At this time, we'll have our opening prayer. Pray with me, please. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We come to you this morning with a prayer of thanksgiving and a prayer that you gave us such a beautiful day to come and study your word, sing together, and be together as a family. We want to pray for those mentioned, the sick of our number that are sick and their family members and ask for your healing hand that those people can come back to us and come back to the church and, and be able to worship with us here. Be with our speaker today and help us to open our ears that we might gain some wisdom from the words. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
you know, this time of year, is, uh, we like to give and receive. But, you know, God gave the ultimate sacrifice and let it, allowing his son to die for us. Uh, we should never forget that and think about it every day. Not just this time of year, but each and every day we get up, we need to give thanks for that. Pray with me, please. Father, we're so thankful for this day. We can come together as a church family. We can encourage one another, but we can glean something from your word that will be shared with us here shortly. But never let us forget the ultimate sacrifice that you allowed your son and he gave for us, that we can live with you in him for an eternity. As we break this bread, let us not forget that sacrifice. Forgive us. In your blessed son's name we ask. Amen. Our dear Father, at this time we want to continue to thank you for your plan of redemption, for the Christ, and for the, the sacrifice of, of him upon that cross, that singular sacrifice that was made for all of us for all time. Father, we are so thankful for that. We pray that you will continue to bless each of us and bless us now as we take this fruit of the vine, which represents his blood on that cross. We pray, dear Lord, that you'll be with us all and that we'll all take these, this emblem in a way that's pleasing in your sight and with the, with the knowledge that, that we know what was done for us, Father. And it's through the name of the Christ that we pray to you. Amen. Today's scripture reading will be from 1 John chapter 5, verses 13 through 15. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what he asked of him. Lord, for loving me, and thank you, Lord, for blessing me. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole and saving my soul. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Let us all with one accord sing praises to Christ the Lord. Let us all. All right, uh, again, if you wouldn't mind standing for this song, this will be our song before uh, Dr. White uh, brings his lesson.
may be seated. Good morning. Welcome to the assembly. I appreciate very much the invitation to speak to you again this morning. For those of you not wearing masks, it's good to see you. For those of you who are wearing masks, it's good to see your eyes again. And uh, it seems to be we've gotten kind of used to that. My name is Wayne White. I am not Mike Williams. I know the likeness is uh, tremendous, but um, tell him that uh, he does a better job than I do. So keep supporting him, will you? I'm grateful to have more here than we had this morning. I was concerned this morning. I think we had 13, no, more than that. The, like my dad used to say, there was a lady sitting down front. When I said, dearly beloved, she thought I was proposing to her. Uh, not the case. So uh, let, let's, uh, let's uh, go into our lesson this morning. I hope you were listening carefully when the scripture was read this morning. John says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. When you go a little bit further down in that same chapter, he uses the term three more times. We know that anyone born of God does not continue in sin. The one who was born of God keeps him safe, and the evil one cannot harm him. We know that we are children of God and that the whole world is under the control of the evil one. We know also that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him, there's the fourth no, who is true. We are in him who is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God of eternal life. I, I'm going to suppose from that passage that John is telling us that there are some things we ought to know. We ought to set our stakes down. We ought to pitch our tent there. We are to accept what we are to know. Now, before we get to what we ought to know, I want to lay some background for getting us there. I don't know where you were on December the 29th. Many of you were in this auditorium because I was here and I saw you. In this pulpit, we brought you to Joshua chapter 3, where the children of Israel were about to enter the promised land. The ark was there, the people was, were there, the priests were there, and God is saying to them, tomorrow we're going to do great things among you. Now, they had been to this position, about to enter the promised land, before, some 40 years earlier, they had gotten to the same spot, and they sent in 12 tribes to check the land of Canaan out. And they looked around and 10 came back and said, no, we can't do this. Even though God has said, this is our country, oh, he's giving it to us. We need to go in and take it. He's giving it to us. 10 came out and said, they're too big. They're, they're giants. We look like grasshoppers to them. In fact, their cities are fortified and we just can't do anything about that. We just cannot go in. Two of them, Joshua and Caleb, came out and said, let's go take them. Let's go into the land. Let's, let's make the land that God has promised us ours. Well, because of the unbelief of the ten, they decided not to go in. So what happened? Well, for 40 years they wandered in a big sandbox that they could have crossed in 11 days if they had started at point A and gone to point B, just walked across it. 40 years until they lost a generation. And now here in Joshua 3, they're back. And they're on the cusp of some promises. They're excited. They got dreams. They have hopes. The Ark of the Covenant, as I said, was there. God is at the forefront. Times were good. Really were good. You and I, last December the 29th, were on the cusp of another year. We were throwing out 2019. We were looking forward to 2020. How's that worked out for you? We were looking forward with some excitement and dreams and hopes, and, and, and we really did look forward to some things. We were excited. I had a fellow tell me recently that he didn't stay up all night for New Year's Eve, but he was this year, just to make sure 2020 left. Well, I'm not sure 2021 is going to be any better, so what is it we ought to know? 
I saw something on Facebook, maybe I ought to share it to you. If, if 2020 were an ice cream truck, one guy said they would be selling liver and onions. That's kind of how 2020 has been, hasn't it? COVID, packed hospitals, numbers going up, numbers going down, plus the fact that we don't know whose numbers to believe. We have a divided country. We had a divided election. We still don't know what's going to happen. You wear a mask or don't wear a mask? Do you wear it in the grocery store or not wear it in the grocery store? Do you have to wear it when your folks come in? I'm going to Tyler here in just a few minutes and, and spend some time with part of my 14 grandkids. Do I wear a mask there or do I not? They've been exposed as well. What do I do? Quarantine. I got tired of myself in quarantine. I saw all the movies I wanted to see. I saw all the TV I wanted to see. I, 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 well, if my wife sees this, she'll deny it. But we did everything around the house we ought to do around the house. Everything's fixed. It's done. What do you do now? You stay home. Oh, I love that, don't you? 2020. All of us have been affected in some way. And if I were to walk down these aisles today, just talk to each one of you, which I'd love to do, I would like to know what keeps you up at night. I'd like to know how you were affected. I'd like to know what comes to your mind. What if I gathered information about what's troubling you at the moment? Would it be something that would trouble me? Is it, is it a loss of job? Is it a loss of income that you've had to suffer? Is it a loss of family members that you've had to lose? Is it a loss of, of movement? Is it, is it a hospital stay you've endured? I know some of you have just gotten back from rehab. That's, that's what we're putting up with, isn't it? We have all these problems. We have masks. And, and I, I mentioned early this morning that I said the first time I went into a bank with a mask on, I really was afraid. I didn't know how they were going to react. You know, you, you, you say, I want, I want $200. You just don't hand them a bag, whatever you do. And maybe you'll get out with $200. But the, the, the whole thing is kind of discombobulating to us. And, and the questions that are raised during times like this are why questions. Why questions? It's not who and what and where and when and how questions. We can solve those. It's the why question. I have why questions during 2020. I have a friend of mine who lost his mother and his stepson in the same hospital, in the same room, on the same day, during the same hour, within 50 minutes, both gone. I have another friend who was in the hospital, ICU many days, for 42 days. He flatlined at least once, but he's okay. Did they not receive enough prayers? Did he receive plenty? What, were, were their lives not measuring up to his? What? what why? And so those kind of questions just kind of come into our minds and, and they fertilize our other questions and they challenge our faith and, and they cause us worry and they plague our minds. And I'm going to suggest to you this morning that one of the problems we've got to solve is that you're never going to solve why questions. You can do some of the others, but the other things that you are to know are going to help you accept the why that's what we struggle with, I think. Now, this is not a new problem. When you look through your Bibles, you will find a lot of why questions. Psalm 2, verse 5, why do the nations rage? Psalm 42, verse 5, why art thou downcast, O my soul? Habakkuk has two questions in it. Habakkuk, the first chapter. One question is, why do the wicked prosper? Another question is, why do you make me look at injustice? I could ask those questions, can't you? I look at Malachi chapter 2, verse 10. Why do you profane the covenant of our Father? And then Job comes along, chapter 7, and asks a very interesting question when he says, Why have you made me your target? Why are you picking on me? Why am I the only one you're looking at? And so the, the why questions just kind of plague us, do they not? So I want you to understand that the struggle is hard, but not new. The struggle is difficult, 
But somehow we have to understand that we will always have these why questions. And so you're probably asking, Wayne, why are you bringing this up? Do you have an answer? Well, I don't have an answer to why questions. Mainly because, and if you look at Isaiah, look at Isaiah chapter 40. Some interesting passages here. Here's why I don't understand why I can't fix why questions. Because I'm not God and I can't counsel him. Verse 13, who has understood the mind of the Lord or instructed him at his counselor? Whom did the Lord consult to enlighten him or who taught him the right way? Who was it that taught him knowledge or showed him the path of understanding? God is God and he'll do what he is, con he is controlling. He is sovereign. Sovereign means the ultimate source of power. He can do as he wishes. And so I cannot always answer why he's doing what he is doing. But there are some things that I think we ought to know. John tells us that. We need to know that we have eternal life. We'll get to that in just a minute. What is it we should know? May I suggest four or five things very quickly and we'll get done. I want you to understand first of all, and this will kind of set the pace for the rest of it. I want you to understand first of all, you need to know that we live in a fallen world. We live in a fallen world. What do I mean by that? I mean that the world is not like God set it up to be. God didn't create some of the things we have in our world. You look back at Genesis chapter 1, he created the oceans. It was good. He created the birds. That's good. He created the sea creatures. That's good. He created the heavens and the earth. That's good. And he created your parents, Adam and Eve, and that was very good. So you've got good, 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 and very good. Everything is out there. God created what is good. So what happened? Let me tell you what happened. He didn't introduce sin. He gave you and me choice. For you and I to have a choice means that we are free will people and we can decide whether or not we want to follow him or not. Now that's going to create problems for the world, is it not? Adam and Eve saw fruit. They wanted to eat it. God said, don't touch it, don't, eat, don't, don't go near it. They said, I wonder if. So they made a bad choice. You see, if he had made them unable to make that choice, if they had been unable to decide for themselves whether to eat the fruit, they would simply have been puppets on a string. And so they would have walked them away from the fruit because he is in control. I'm not talking about God being that kind of controlling. He gave you the right to make a decision whether you're going to follow him or not. And as a result of our decisions, we are living in a fallen world. They made the wrong choice and created for us what has been called the sinful nature. Now, listen carefully. I do not believe in original sin. We have some children in this audience this morning. They are not sinful. They are not responsible for things they don't understand. They are not sinful from birth, and therefore we have to baptize them when they're babies. Not the point. The point is, because of Adam and Eve's decision to introduce sin into life, you and I are very much based the same way. We, are, we have sinful natures. We're born grabbing, and we have to be taught to release. So we have this nature. We're just kind of pulled that way, aren't we? Um, I told a story this morning. I'm not sure everybody got it, and maybe I should leave it alone. But a guy moved to a town, and in that town was a kind of a compound. It had walls, and, and, and every day he walked past that compound on the way to work. He, caught, he heard people inside calling out numbers, 28, 28, 28, 28. He walked by it the next week, and they were saying, 14, 14, 14, 14. And, and there was a knot hole in that fence. And there was a sign, do not look through this knot hole. He went by the third time, 62, 62, 62. Fourth time he went by, he said, I had to look. So he snuck over to the fence, put his eye up, looked in, and they were yelling, you know, again, another number, 49, 49, 49. He said he looked through and somebody stuck him in the eye with their finger. As he walked away, he heard 50, 50, 50. <laughs> What's that silly story tell you? It tells you we're drawn to what we're not supposed to do. That's the sinful nature in us. Now, 
how are we to deal with that? James chapter 1 says, count it all joy when you face trials and temptations. What's he asking you to do? He's asking you to trust in what you know. You know, first of all, you're in a sinful world. You're in a fallen world. So what is it that we know that, that ought to help us live the life that God wants us to live in this fallen world? Okay, here we are. You need to know that God is still in control. He's still in control. That doesn't mean that you're going to get everything you want. That doesn't mean that everything's going to go the way you want it. That doesn't mean that 2020 is going to be a better year. 21, or 2021 could be a worse year. It doesn't mean that you're going to like everything that happened in 2021. It just means that God is in control. I, I think immediately of Job chapter 1. Satan is walking around, somehow gets into God's presence. And God, being proud of Job, says, have you, met my, have you seen Job? He's an upright man. He's honest. He's just. He reveres me. He's, he's my man. And, and Satan says, hey, take what he's got and he'll curse you. God says, have at it. So Satan goes and takes Job's kids and takes Job's job and takes Job's way of living and all of that, takes it all away to the point that Job's wife says, curse God and die. And Job in chapter 2 simply says, should I expect good from God and not bad? It's an interesting thought. If you're a blessed person, do you really think God only owes you good stuff? And that somehow bad's not going to come your direction? I'm not saying that he creates bad for you to see if you can sin. I'm suggesting to you that he allows some things to happen to you, potentially, to do what James says, to mature you, provide some perseverance, and to grow your faith. Maybe that's what God's up to. And Satan comes back and says, ah, uh, he, he did a pretty good job on that one. But let me, let me touch him. And God, still proud of who Job is, said, don't take his life. Don't take his life. And so he goes back and gives him the boils. You know the story. You know the story. Gives him the boils. And Job's wife is still, and, and, and I, be careful. Don't, don't look down on Job's wife. She does much of what we would do. But Job at that point says, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. God's still in control. Jeremiah 23, God says to the children of Israel, I know the plans I have for you. Now I know that's told to the children of Israel, but do you really think he's going to tell the children of Israel, I have plans for you and not have something for the church to do, something for you to do? If you're a child of God, you've got something to do. He's got plans for you. Maybe we need to be looking for those plans. Luke chapter 12, Matthew chapter 10 reminds us that if a sparrow falls to the ground, who knows? God knows. You lose hair off your head. Who can count the ones you got left? God does. He knows. And he loves. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. He's in control. He can control what is tempting you. Now, you have to be doing your part. You have to be doing some things on your own. You have to be submitting to him. You have to be honoring to him. You have to be committed to him. I understand that. Romans 8, 28, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. It doesn't say all things, work for good, or all things are good. It says all things work for good. So please understand. Here's one thing you know. First of all, you're in a fallen world. Secondly, God is still in control. A third no is this. God desires to have a people he can call his. He did that in the Old Testament. He called them a royal priesthood. He said, I, I didn't choose you because you were the biggest and the baddest, and I didn't choose you because you had the best army, and I didn't choose you because you had the best judicial system. I chose you because I loved you. I chose you. And so when you come to the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 2 uses some of the same, exactly same terminology. We are children of God. We are a royal priesthood. We are a holy nation. We are people belonging to God. Why? Because he chose us, he loved us, and we are committed to him, and we are his people. We need to see the church. That's the reason why Jesus said, I'm going to build my church. He didn't say, I'm going to build your church, and your church, and your church. He said, I'm going to build my church. Why is he going to build his church? 
because he wants to have his people together as his nation, as his holy nation, and his royal priesthood. He wants that, and God wants it. And if he desires to have a people that is his, do we not know he's going to support us in all that we do for him? Do we not know? Second Chronicles 7, 12 through 16, God speaks to Solomon at the dedication of the temple and says, God says, if my people, if my people will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. You know what that says? It doesn't have a thing to do with how. He says, I'll hear. It doesn't tell you what he's going to do. He doesn't tell you he's going to fix it. He doesn't tell you he's going to have a vaccine for it. He doesn't tell you he's going to solve all of it by having your mask. He doesn't say any of that. He just says, it will be heard, and I'll take care of things. Now, when? I don't know. That's where our faith comes in. You remember when God was speaking to uh, Moses at the fiery bush? He said, I've heard my people. I've heard my people in Egypt. How long it had been since they get, had gone to Egypt? It had been 400 years. You may not get over COVID-19. You may not get over this COVID thing. But you know God's in control. God knows what he's doing. And God wants the people that are his. A fourth thing he wants and that we ought to know. We ought to know that he calls us to be holy, but he offers us help in the process. Leviticus chapter 11. I am the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy. 1 Peter chapter 1. I'm holy. You be holy. You know, that's, that's kind of challenging, isn't it? Do you consider yourself a holy person? It's kind of like the word saint. Well, I'm no saint. Well, you better be. Are you a holy person? Do you do things that are holy? Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that we are made holy. How? By the sacrifice that was done 2,000 years ago. And we're also told in Hebrews that without holiness, no one will see God. So it sounds to me like it's essential that we know we're holy, that we know we are holy people. And, and, and it's not only because he provides protection for us for temptation. He allows you to be holy, but he does it in helping protect you from what you can't stand up under. But he also has done something else. John 14, 15, and 16, he goes to leave. He says, I'm going to my Father. But he's talking to his disciples. He said, I'm going to send you somebody. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. I'm going to send you the paraclete, the one who stands beside you. Acts 2.38, have you looked at that? That's one of our passages, isn't it? You, when you're baptized, you receive forgiveness of your sins and what? The gift of the Holy Spirit. That's not a copy of the King James Version of the Bible. That's the Holy Spirit has been given to you to live in you to do what? Help you be holy. Help you live up to what your standards are. Help you to be what God wants you to be. Help you be what this world needs. We have the Holy Spirit. And something else, brethren, I, I've got to say this. I'll just step away just for a second. One of the things that has bothered me about COVID-19 is that it has kept this from happening. You know, one of the things that you ought to be involved in in helping one another stay holy is the assembly. Now, I know, I know that there's dangers out there. And I know sometimes you have to, uh, you have to come virtually. I understand that. And I know that older people are susceptible to this COVID-19. You know, they said everybody over 75 years of age is susceptible to this. I wish they had told me that 10 years ago. You know, but they didn't. But what God has called us together for is not just so you can be pleased to sit in a pew. Do you realize that the people on this side of the auditorium need the people on this side of the auditorium? And both you guys need the people in this side of the auditorium? That's why the face has to be seen. That, and I'm not telling you to go against rules. I'm not. I'm just saying there's wisdom in God calling us to be holy and saying this is part of that process. The writer of Hebrews says when we meet together, we are to spur one another on. How do you do that? Well, you stay at your home and I stay in mine. However you do it, get together. That's why the Bible tells us to love one another and to honor one another and to be kind to one another and to bear one another's burdens, and all the one another's that go with it. 
That's part of the wisdom of God. When he calls you to be holy, I'm to help you, you're to help me, we are to help us. And that's part of what we need to know. God didn't leave you alone out here to be holy all by your lonesome. He didn't give you an assignment and walk away. He decided to give you an assignment with a group. And if you're weak, you call on them. And if you're weak, you call on them. And if you're all weak, get together and admit it and try to find out what God's answer to the why is. He called us together for a purpose. And church is part of that process where he called us to be holy. He offers us help in his challenge to be holy. Know that. Here's something else you need to know. I think you need to know that your salvation is secure. Your salvation is secure. Now, I'm going to say something. Make sure you understand this. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. Let me say this clearly. I do not believe in once saved, always saved. However, I also don't believe in once saved, barely saved. This idea that, oh, made a mistake, I fall out of the church. What? If God has saved you, you are a saved individual. And, and you can walk away from the faith. You can turn away from Him. You can fall from grace. But it's going to be a decision you make to walk away. If you decide you want to be a heathen, remember the choice? You've got the choice to be a heathen. You've got a choice to eat the wrong fruit. You've got the choice to eat from the tree that God said not to eat of. You can do that if you wish. But the idea that, that, that this narrow road we're on is a tightrope that we have to be careful that we just don't fall off of has been, has been scaring church members for decades. And I want us to understand, God is God of a family. And he doesn't want you to leave or get lost at all. And God will do whatever he can, in whatever way he can, to make sure you continue to be his. Your salvation is secure. You can walk away if you wish. His desire is not to allow you to walk away. That's why Colossians chapter 1, Paul talks about the mystery. What's the mystery? of It's Christ in you. Christ in you. Like the Holy Spirit. Galatians 3, 26 through 29, be clothed in Christ. We are clothed in him. And all of this, all of this while the why of life is going on. And we are so often focused on the why that we don't remember what we should know. That's the challenge I lay before you this morning. And the final no is this. I want you to know that he wants to be with you eternally. I love that. Don't you? John 14, I go to prepare a place. I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again. I'll come again so I can take you to where I am. He wants us to be with him. Will that help you sleep better at night? Will, will that give you a bit more peace when the whys of life come up? Will that give you a sense of, of understanding that God isn't a mean person out to find the mistake you've made and use his giant fly swatter to squash you every chance he has for every mistake you've made. Really, I don't read that. My salvation is secure and he wants me eternally. So what have I said? God's in control. I want you to know that he has a desire for his people. Know that he wants you to be holy and he's giving help. Know that your salvation is secure. And please know that he wants to be with you eternally.
So what now? Well, okay. 2020 will leave. A few more days. A few more days and 2020 will be in your rear view mirror. Do not look back. Satchel Page, black baseball player said, don't ever look back. Whatever's behind you may be trying to catch up. Don't look back. Look ahead. 2021, I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. You don't either. I will guarantee you that there will be some whys in 2021. Why'd that happen? I don't know. Depends on what we know. Please know you are God's children. Know that he loves you. Know that he sacrificed for you. Know that he wants us to be with him. And in the chaos of a year's worth of whys, you and I can have peace because Jesus Christ died 2,000 years ago for you, for me. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. Now that's from Christ himself. You will have trouble, but be at peace. I've overcome the world. I don't know where you are this morning. I really don't. I don't know whether you're anxious. I don't know whether you're in Christ, out of Christ. I don't know whether you need prayers. I don't know whether you need $5. I don't know what you need. I will say this. God knows. And a life that is His will have the help necessary to make sure that the life to come is in your front view mirror. If you need baptism, if you need baptism, if you need prayers, whatever you need, come right now while we stand, while we sing. Please pray with me. Dear Lord, you are an awesome God, so worthy to be praised. We're so lucky to have you give your son so that we may live without sin. Continue to watch over and guide us always. Be with those members of the church and their family and their friends who are ill and not well. Bring them health and bring them back to the church again. We're so thankful for all you've given us. You've given us our homes, our family, our friends, and even in these bad times, we have hope and joy and love because of you. Continue to watch over and guide us always. We do this in your holy name. Amen.